Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. We're sitting in a 2006 Ford Fusion with the V6. The customer says that the engine lacks power. And that's all I know. So let's dig in. There is a check engine light on. We'll start it up in a second. Let's go ahead, pull codes real quick, see if there's anything useful there, and then we'll fire it up and have a listen. All right, pulled up all the codes. We have a P0300. That's a standard random misfire or multiple cylinder misfire detected. And the reason for the multiple cylinder misfire is because we have four, five, and six all being detected as a misfire. Ford, how they label their cylinders. This is a V6, so there's three on one side, three on the other. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six. So a four, five, and six is all one bank. Whoop. So all one bank is misfiring, at least according to the engine computer, that's what it saw. And then misfire detected at start. So this misfire is happening right away. All right, let's fire it up, get a listen to it. All right, here we go. Okay, start it up. It's kind of rattling, you can kind of feel the misfire. Let me go ahead and get some live data and give it some throttle too, and you can see the RPMs. Uh, super sluggish trying to get those rpms up let's go to read data close the door all right all right so the pids i have is upstream and downstream oxygen sensor bank one upstream and downstream bank two mass airflow sensor short term and long term and right away i can see our short term and long term are telling us something Short term bank one is positive 38, positive 30, 33, 35, it's kind of bouncing around some. Short term is negative 24. Let's go ahead and graph this. That's a telltale sign of an exhaust restriction. Lack of power would confirm or support a exhaust restriction as well. So this is our downstream, I mean our upstream one, and this is our upstream two. It's kind of flat there, but that one is, is switching like it's supposed to. This one should be switching as well, but it's not. So positive. Now they're both positive. Hmm. Let me just go back and refresh. So yeah, now they're both positive, and they're about positive the same. So that's kind of weird. That's why we collect the data. We can analyze it later. But the fact that they were opposites of each other, and I'll show you that. Let's take you to the classroom real quick, and I'll show you why having the exhaust restricted would cause a reverse or a flip, one being positive, one being negative. Let's go to the classroom real quick. Welcome to the classroom. This is an oxygen sensor. Oxygen sensors are a pretty cool piece of technology, but they only sense one thing, oxygen. That's an important fact to keep in mind. Uh, let's make that full screen. Beep, boop, beep. Starting on the far left, our intake stroke, as the piston's moving down, the intake valve is open, and oxygen and fuel is being sucked into the cylinder. During the compression stroke, as the piston moves up, the oxygen and fuel is being squeezed into a tight little space. Those atoms are bouncing all over the place, heating up. And then, kapaya, the power stroke. That flame forces the piston down, the burning of fuel also consumes most of the oxygen. But even after complete combustion, there's still some oxygen left over. During the exhaust stroke, as the piston moves up, the exhaust valve is open. That oxygen is forced out the exhaust and sniffed by the oxygen sensor. Let's go back to the intake. Let's say we have the perfect amount of oxygen, the perfect amount of fuel. It gets compressed on the compression stroke super tight, but no combustion. Nothing happens on the power stroke, therefore no oxygen is consumed and we have the same amount of oxygen on the exhaust as we did on the intake. That moves out the exhaust on the exhaust stroke and the oxygen sensor sniffs that. Only this time it says, hey, we got too much oxygen left over. We must not have had enough fuel to burn the oxygen. So it thinks it's lean. But is it lean? It is not. We had the right amount of fuel, we had the right amount of oxygen, just no combustion to burn the fuel and the oxygen. It doesn't sniff the fuel left over, it only sniffs the oxygen, so it's thinking it's lean. What's the computer gonna do? 
add more fuel to compensate for what it thinks is a lean condition. Let's start over. Let's start on the right hand side, the exhaust stroke. Let's say we have a block in the exhaust. So as this fuel and oxygen isn't burned, it goes, uh oh, we can't go anywhere. So it builds up and now we have a lot of pressure. Well, what's the next stroke? The intake stroke. As that intake valve opens up, instead of fuel and oxygen coming in, there's pressure. So fuel and oxygen is actually being pushed out of the intake, back into the intake manifold. Let's say that was bank one. Well now, bank two, intake stroke, the intake manifold now has a bunch of fuel in it. So this cylinder is getting its normal amount of fuel and air plus an additional amount because of bank one's exhaust restriction. So it goes through the compression stroke, compressing that super tight and then kapaya, only it had more fuel than it should have. So there's only a tiny, tiny bit of oxygen left over because the more fuel it had, the more oxygen it consumes. Now that goes out the exhaust and the oxygen sensor sniffs that. The engine computer is gonna say, hey, we don't have enough oxygen left over from this combustion. It must be running rich, which it is. So what is the engine computer gonna do? It's gonna take away fuel, giving us those negative fuel trims. So the exhaust restriction causes a no combustion. The no combustion has excess oxygen in it. The engine computer is gonna think it's running lean, so it adds more fuel. The pressure from the exhaust pushes that fuel and air back into the intake, getting sucked in from the other side, making it run rich. So that's indicative of a, like a catalytic converter or an upstream exhaust restriction. So it's doing it again. Why it went back to both being positive and mi mirroring each other, I'm not sure. But let's go under the hood, let's run some tests, see what we come up with. All right, for our initial test, we have an in-cylinder pressure transducer, and that'll let us know what the exhaust is doing. If there's any restriction, we'll capture it here on the scope. I don't think it's ignition related. To have three ignition uh, coils or plugs all fail on one bank, at the same time and not the other. That's a little uh, odd, but I still have two ignition setups. This is the input from the PCM, the switching on and off of the coil, and this will give a coil waveform here of the actual spark event. Again, I really don't think it's related to ignition or fuel for it to just kill this one side. But if it does, like if it's a wire somewhere killing this whole ignition side, I guess that, that can happen. Um, so that's why we have there. My money's on exhaust restriction, just based on the scan tool data, but let's test it and confirm. So here we are on the scope, there's gonna be a glare. So once it's done recording, we'll, I'll take it in the car, remove the glare, and then we can, we can go over it together. So I'm gonna go ahead and zero that one, start record, start it up. Whoa, so I started recording, I started it up, and this time, you hear that? That sounds like backfire into the intake manifold. So that's a new noise. Uh, we got enough recorded, so let's go ahead and shut it off. All right, here we are. Let's zoom in a little. Just on this little spot here. Ooh, okay. Let's zoom in one more time. Yikes, let's get some cursors. And I'll explain this in a second. Let's drop down to here. Then we'll move this one over here. Okay, so this is a compression stroke, power stroke. Here, let's, let's mark the cam. There we go. So compression stroke here. So everything's closed. The valves are closed. Piston's going up. So pressure's going to increase. And it increased to about between 120 and 125. So 123, 122 in there. And then the decompression or the power stroke, but we're not producing power because we don't have the spark plug in. So it's actually a decompression. So that decompression. And then this is the exhaust push. The exhaust valve should be open and then it, it should push out the exhaust. Typically that'll be below uh, two and a half PSI. We are at 85 at the end of the exhaust stroke. Then we have the intake stroke, so the intake valve, the exhaust valve closes, intake valve opens, and then that gets that pull, and then 
our everything closes and then we're back up on our compression that's interesting that our exhaust it's almost as if the exhaust valve isn't opening but it is opening some because if it wasn't opening at all then this pressure would be very similar to the 123 because if it wasn't opening at all then it would be a compression decompression and the exact same compression but it looks like it is opening some to release some of the pressure but it's yeah, it must be opening too early closing too early so there's still some exhaust gas in there when the valve closes very interesting so with this in mind with this in mind let me think for a second all right so that's a little different than what i was anticipating i was anticipating a restricted exhaust usually a restricted exhaust is going to be around 5 10 psi i've seen some pretty bad ones uh, like around 15 to 20 psi not 85 psi and where that that hump is on the exhaust stroke is at the end of the exhaust stroke usually if there's a clog in the exhaust it's going to start right at the beginning as soon as that piston is trying to force exhaust out it's going to start right away there'll be a little ramp and it'll flatten off that whole exhaust stroke let me pull up an exhaust restriction just so you can see what I'm talking about. And then I'll turn the camera back around, show you on here what we're looking at, what should be the case. Because if you're not familiar with these waveforms, it can be a little confusing what we're actually looking at. So let me show you one with an exhaust leak. You'll see the difference. I don't think this is exhaust related. I think there's something else going on with the timing. Why we're not getting timing errors I'm not sure, um, but let's, let me show you what one should look like. All right, so this is one I took a long time ago, and this is a really good one. So there's no exhaust clog in this one. So you'll notice the compression stroke does its compression thing. This is a lot lower at 57. That's pretty normal for a idle running compression. So the other one being 120, 123 that's that's a bit excessive for just an idle compression so we got the compression stroke the decompression stroke or what would be deemed the power stroke but we're not producing power so decompression stroke now this is the exhaust push notice on the decompression stroke we are around negative uh, nine ish psi so it it actually pulls a vacuum then as the exhaust valve opens it equalizes right here is zero and so if you draw straight we're pretty much equal with zero and that's perfect that's exactly what our exhaust should, should be doing there's a smidge bit of back pressure but not a pounds worth of back pressure and then the exhaust valve closes so here we have the intake the exhaust valve closes the intake opens and then we draw this vacuum again as the intake or the piston is coming down it's sucking in the intake and there's a little bit of vacuum there so this is a perfect waveform uh, compression power exhaust and we'll see that little little plateau on the exhaust uh, intake and then and then compression again so even if there was an exhaust clog this exhaust would open the same. It would just go higher and plateau and come down. So that's an exhaust restriction. Would still You'd still have that plateau because the restriction is during the entire exhaust stroke. So let's go back to what we had here. Let me uh, remark them. The exhaust stroke should start here I'm not drawing at the moment. I thought I was drawing. But the exhaust stroke should start here and be flat and then come down. But it's not. Nothing's happening. And then you get a spike at the end of the exhaust stroke, which lets me think that the timing is off. The timing is advanced quite a bit. And it's opening during the decompression and closing before the end of the exhaust stroke. And that's why we get that spike, because it's opening too early therefore closing too early. So why aren't we getting cam crank correlation codes? Let's go under, hook up the scope to our cam position sensors and see what's happening. 
Okay, I figured out the cam timing code dilemma. Why aren't we getting a timing code if the timing's off? Well, that's because there's only one cam position sensor. It's kind of hard to see in there. It's right there. Let me see if I can shine a flashlight. Right there is where it is. And that position sensor only detects or only monitors the intake camshaft. So there is no exhaust cam position sensor. So if the exhaust is off all day long, the engine computer won't even know that it's off. Whereas if the intake cam was off, then it would be throwing a code. Same with the back bank. I was looking, there's a cam position sensor only for the intake, not the exhaust. So there you go. So we can have a timing issue without throwing a timing code. All right, so hopefully this is making sense up to this point. Let me show you the waveform one more time. And because remember we were hearing that kind of pop, pop, tink, tink noise coming out of the intake. Well, let me show you why that might be. So right here, let me pull it down right there. We are right about 85 PSI on our exhaust push. Well, right after our exhaust stroke is what? Our intake stroke. So we have 85 PSI and then poof, our intake opens up. And that's why we can get that popping noise out of the intake because all this pressure is being poofed or blown back into the intake once that valve opens up. So I think our next move is to pull the valve cover off. Because the exhaust cam does not have a cam position sensor, I can't hook up a scope to see if it's off one way or off the other. The in-cylinder pressure transducer does show, or at least as far as my understanding of reading it, it does show that it's advanced, which is kind of unusual for a timing chain to be advanced. Usually it's retarded if it skips a tooth or two. Uh, it usually goes to the retarded side of things. So advanced is a little unusual, but that's what the pressure transducer is showing me. Uh, but there's no way to confirm with a cam position sensor. If it had an exhaust position sensor, we could hook up the scope to the exhaust, hook up the scope to the intake, or exhaust on one side, exhaust on the other, compare the two, but there's not that available to us. So let's go ahead, pull the cover off. We'll manually rotate the engine to line up the marks where they're supposed to be, and we'll see uh, if this is off. And I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that's what it is, is an exhaust timing issue. All right, we got it pulled into the garage. I'm gonna go ahead and vacuum around this. I like vacuuming instead of blowing. That way it just doesn't get all over and uh, maybe blow in your face or get dust in the air. So I'm just gonna vacuum it real quick, just all around. I'm gonna pull this cover off and look at the timing manually. Let's see if this will come up. Okay, there we go. Nice and easy. So on this engine, just the intake cam is phased. This is the exhaust cam, no phaser. You see how it's just a regular uh, geared sprocket where this is nice and thick, has a really big uh, body to it. That's for the phasing, the oil control valve right here controls how much oil pressure comes in here and it phases the cam retarded or advanced depending on the needs of the engine. And that helps with performance, economy, all sorts of good stuff. So that's great. Now, just kind of looking at the engine real quick, looking at the cams. I don't see anything out of place. All the roller followers are there. Good that way. So let me rotate the engine. I probably have to take the tire off. Let me rotate the engine. We'll line up where the timing marks are supposed to go on here. That's a lot of slack. That's enough for it to jump for sure. Um, but yeah, let me do that manually. We'll get the timing marks where they're supposed to go and see how off it is, how many teeth or how many whatevers that it's off. Cool. 
So here's a picture of the alignment. It's kind of goofy. If you notice right here, so that's the variable valve timing solenoid. It has this little leg. That dot, that alignment mark, is kind of in the middle of that leg. So it makes a kind of a straight shot. If you look on here, this is the variable valve timing solenoid. This is that leg. So this timing mark should be a straight shot off of that. Let me show you that yellow mark right there. And that's how I have it. If you look, it's, it's hard to see, but if you look straight dead onto it, that's where that is, right in the middle of that, that leg. Then if you come back, so if that's in the middle of that leg and the intake is right on, the exhaust, if you look, should be pretty much parallel with this valve timing solenoid. If you look right here is the notch and then right here is that other dot. So that notch and that dot should actually be parallel with this, but they're not, they're way off. I marked it right here where I think it should have been and that's two teeth off. So we're two teeth advanced on our exhaust cam. So I think that pretty much proves it what we had suspected. Now, originally I suspected an exhaust restriction just based on the scan tool data, but once we got that in pressure cylinder or in cylinder pressure transducer in the hole, it painted a different picture for us. And here we are pulling the cover off and we see that our timing uh, is two teeth off. It should be right here, parallel. All right, there we go. That is the diagnosis of this 06 Ford Fusion. It took us in a couple different directions. Our initial thought, was exhaust restriction, uh, but it ended up being uh, exhaust valve was opening too soon, closing too soon, which did give us a restriction. We still had a restriction on the exhaust side of things, but not in the exhaust. It had to do with the valve. Uh, the valve timing was just shifted a little advanced. So uh, hopefully this was interesting. Hopefully our next video will be tearing this down, putting a new timing chain kit, timing chain, tensioners, whatever else is involved. That front cover has to come off. It's a lot of work, but we'll talk to the customer, see if they want to proceed with it. And hopefully that'll be the next video, how to do one of those and then uh, running just right. All right. Well, thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully entertaining, educational in some way. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe. See you on the next one.